Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Praise Good morning, Lord. dear Glory. branches. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for this wonderful day. Lord, we come to you with praises and thanksgiving our lips. Father, you be magnified. You be magnified and glorified, Lord, and lifted high. Hallelujah. This morning, He is magnified in our lives. He is magnified in this church today. In His church. Glory to your name, Lord. Sing this. He lowers us to raise us. So we can sing His praises. Whatever is His way. All is well. Amen, church. It makes us rich and poor. We might trust it more. <laughs> Whatever is his way, all is well.
Oh, cleft for me. Hallelujah. Let us hide, let us hide ourselves in thee. Yes. Let us hide ourselves in the cleft of the rock today in Jesus Christ. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mighty, mighty God, mighty God. Yes, Lord, we hide ourselves, Lord. In the secret place of the Most High God where we're safe and secure in your loving arms. Amen. Hallelujah today. Amen. Though the waters may come, they will not overflow us. Hallelujah, Jesus. Though the fires may come, they will not burn us. Hallelujah, right? Right, branches? Glory to your name. In heavenly armor, we enter the land. The battle is the Lord's, and he's given us weapons to fight. Hallelujah today. Amen. This is an old, old song. Ha-ha! Okay. <laughs> We're staying on the battlefield. In heavenly honor, we'll enter the land. The battle belongs to the Lord. The weapon that's fashioned against me will stand. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory and honor. All power and strength to the Lord. We sing. Honor, all power and strength to the Lord. I give all power and strength to the Lord. When the power of darkness comes in like a flood, the battle belongs to the Lord. He's raised up a standard, the power of his blood. The battle belongs to the Lord. And we sing glory and honor, all power and strength to the Lord. And we sing glory and honor, all power to the Lord, oh, we give all power and strength to the Lord. Yes, we do. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Lord. Praise your name, Father. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you where they crucified my Lord. Oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there when they my Lord Were you there They nailed him to the tree Were you there When they nailed him to the tree into the family of God. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord, branches. Let's head into the, the Bible study. It's a different feeling today. I'm sensing something different today. I'm playing bass. Hallelujah. It's not because of you. It's What's a spiritual that? thing, honey. Obvious. Beside the obvious. It's a spiritual thing. And let us see what spiritual eyes today. We just wanted to see what it would sound like. 
Hallelujah. Praise your name, Jesus. We're going to head into um, understanding intercession. And what it is. What is intercession? And this is going to be, or maybe be a lengthy study. It might end next week. Who knows when the Lord wants to end it, right? And what he has to say to us today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your precious word. Mm. Thank you, Lord, for pouring into us in yes, this Lord hour, God. Lord God. Yes, Lord. That you never leave us or forsake us, that your words are yes and amen. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever, as your word says. Lord, and, and what you imparted into the, the, the prophets of old, Lord God, you're still imparting to us today all the way to the end of the age, Lord. You will continue to speak to your people. You will continue to lead and guide us. You will continue to show us things to come. Lord, your word says that you, before you do a thing, you will show your people, Lord God. So, Lord, we're, we're trusting in you, Lord, that you are speaking today yes, Lord. to our hearts. You are leading us by your word. Everything is confirmed in your word, Lord God. Yes, Lord. We test everything in light of your scriptures. Yes, Lord. Lord, that gives us life today. In Jesus' mighty name, move upon these words. It's not my words, Lord God. It's what you're speaking to your body today. Yes, Lord. Lord so we open up our hearts, Lord, to receive what you have for us, Lord God, that yes, we may Lord. be strengthened and changed for time and eternity. Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Holy Spirit, illuminate our understanding. What is intercession? Well, it's it's very simple. Prayer. <laughs> it's simply, there's no magical thing behind it. It's just prayer. And it flows out of having a close relationship with our Heavenly Father. With Jesus. It Prayer and relationship go hand in hand. Right? Being in fellowship with our Heavenly Father. And where we find out his will, we have to know his will. If we're not in relationship, if we're not in fellowship with him, how can we know the will of the Father and what he desires? We need to find out what God's will is and what he wants to do in the earth. Then we intercede according to that. And we need to ask God to do it. You know, it's not even by our spirit, it's not by our might, but it's by the spirit of the living God. Amen. We are the vessels. We are vessels of honors. Some some are vessels of honor, some are vessels of hay and and stubble Double. and and you know, there's different types of vessels that God makes us in. But let us strive to be those vessels of honor today and stay in right relationship with Him so we can hear what He wants, the desires of His heart in us and how we can pray the will of God. We need to find out what God wants to do on the earth in this hour. Hallelujah. First Corinthians 3 9 says, For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field. You are God's building. Right. Laborers together with God. And in Romans 8 27, we have to pray according to God's will. God's will. Not our wants, not our list of wants and stuff. <laughs> now, oh, good. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit mm -hmm. is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So we pray according to the knowledge of God, to what God wants. The mind of the Spirit, with the mind of the Spirit. And also in 1 John 5.14, just for those who may be thinking, okay, Anne's a little whacked here. No, 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 no. I've always thought I'm so. going, what? I'm going to back this up with the word of God. First John 5, 14. If we ask anything, anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. Uh, it says, now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Amen. That's it. That's it right there. It has to be in accordance to God's word Amen. and his will. Yes. Nothing else. Yes. Nothing added. Nothing taken away. God's sovereignty. Man's responsibility. There are two verses in John 5 that bring um, a beautiful balance between ask what you will and asking according to God's will. 
So, John, we'll, we'll look in uh, John 15, 7. John. Oh. Or is that John 10, 7? No, John 15, 7. So her branches, I'm ahead of her here in her notes. John 15. You're we'll, we'll go back to John 5. But you're probably already there. John 15, 7. Uh-huh. You guys are all probably already there. Asking according to God's will. If you abide in me and my words and abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. Right. And in verse 27 of John 5, ask what you will. John 15, 7 was asking according to God's will. Now, John 5, 27, wow. this is what Jesus said. Oh, yeah, go back. I never like starting in the middle of a verse because you don't get the context. Okay, then read. For, for as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Right. And has given him authority to execute judgment, also because yeah. he is the Son of Man. Is that the one you want to read? Yes. Name? Okay. But, however, Jesus said in, in verse 30 of John, of, of John 5, Uh, I can of myself do nothing. As right. I hear, I judge. And my judgment is righteous because I do not seek my own will, right, but the right. will of the Father who sent, who sent me. me. So even Jesus said, I can do nothing on my own. So authority is given to Jesus because he's the Son of Man. Yet he can't do anything by himself. He Even Jesus couldn't do anything by himself. So then we read... We, we read on in verse 30, Jesus says, you know, Jesus always goes back to the will of God as his reference. Jesus mm -hmm. was always submitted to the will of his Father, but his Father depends on him to do his will on the earth, right? We have to do the will of the Father. Father always waits to be invited as we discovered in in yesterday's lesson he waits to be invited into our domain to do his will by how we discovered it's by prayer it's by prayer they were dependent on one another you could say i mean father and jesus they're dependent on one another jesus was sent to do the work here on earth and father did not and would not work without him. They were one. And Jesus didn't do anything apart from the will of his Father. Nothing. Because he said, what did he say? What I see the Father do, that's what I do. Right? And this is our pattern. Jesus is our perfect pattern today for prayer. That the Father and the Son had. The same pattern and a special, unique relationship between the two. Jesus saw what his father was doing and what he wanted done, and he did it. Perfect obedience. Perfect obedience. Jesus as the Son even of Man. Even after the cross, as Paul said later. Even as the Son of Man had the responsibility to ask his father to work out his will on earth. And God the Father then had a moral right to enter the situation on earth and answer the prayer of the Son of Man. Matthew 6, 10. Repeat after me. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth That's right. as it is in heaven. heaven right. Matthew 6, verse 10. Oh, and that doesn't say Matthew, does it? No. Huh. Your kingdom come. Your will be done, Father. Your will be done. Prayer involves knowing God's will. And we need to humbly and faithfully ask him to bring about his purpose on the earth. Prayer, that's what it is. Having that relationship with him. 
asking. It's, it's a conversation between God, asking God and him answering us. And this is the right. first part, uh, as you will, of the, of the Lord's Prayer. We're talking about prayer right. as, as, in Matthew 6, 10. Yes. Your kingdom come, your will your be will done on be done earth done as on it earth. is in heaven. We're asking right. in right. our prayer. And that's the example exactly that Jesus set for us. Here. It's what the scriptures are saying. This world that we live in is our God-given realm of responsibility and authority. God waits for our prayers in order to, to act. When we carry out our right to pray, God then has the right to come on the scene and show his power, to show his purpose, you know, to answer our prayers, to show this purpose. Prayer is bringing God into the situation in, in a responsible way. God, God, bringing God into the situation. But he won't come without an invitation. I can't stress that enough. Sometimes we know we just sit back and we just, we just wait. We wait for God to do something and, you know, or we try to do it in our own strength. And God said, no, you have to come to me. You have to come and ask me. You, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I think Jesus demonstrated that in his ministry. Definitely. There are sometimes, he would come across a blind man. I'm mm -hmm. thinking of Bar the blind Bartimaeus. And he would thing. ask him, what do you want? And he could see, obviously <laughs> he was blind. The Lord could see he was blind, but he didn't, he, didn't, he asked him that question. What do you want me to do for you? The blind man, whoever, when we approach God, we have to articulate it. We have to speak it out to the Lord and tell him. It's a good example of that, what Anne's talking about right now. Okay, so some of you may be asking, what do you mean praying the will of God? Well, there are some things that happen when we do this. First, we pray God's prayers. We're praying by the Spirit, right? The mind of the Spirit. We're praying God's prayers. And we will feel God's heart. What is the heart of the Lord? What's going on in his mind? What are his thoughts? That's how we shape right? our own hearts, right? Yeah, yeah. Because when we pray the heart of God, we are shaped, it shapes our own hearts into understanding the will right, and desire right. of God. That I may have spiritual understanding, Colossians 1 says, right? That I may know the will of God, you know, and, and um, have that spiritual understanding that I may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work, right? Mm -hmm. You know, increasing in the knowledge of God. Why Amen. do we want to increase in the knowledge of God? So we can know his will, Amen. know his heart, know his thoughts. Yes. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, I want to touch on another area of prayer. And I want, I want to begin by first looking at the breastplate of the scepter of righteousness. And it's very important when fighting in the spirit, in intercession. There, this is very important. Let's look at Ephesians 6.11. How did I know you were going to go there? Put on the whole armor of God. Right? Why? And it tells us why. It'll tell us why here. So we're able to... Some of you could probably even quote it. End. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Just verse 11. When we go to prayer, we are now entering the realm of the spiritual warfare that Paul talks about. This is where we're going to be attacked the most. Our prayer life is attacked the most True. as Christians. True. Satan does not want us knowing the will or the mind or the heart of God because he knows that our prayers are powerful and that we connect with God and we move his heart and his hand in the earth, the heavenly realms, but in the earthly realms. We're bringing God's will down to earth and he's so terrified of that. Hallelujah. We're gonna, this is where we're going to be most attacked. And, and mostly intercessors and prayer warriors are the people that are attacked the most. And this is from my own experience as well. And also worshipers. <laughs> you know, praising pastors, praising worshipers. And um, 
even by watching others around me, intercessors and prayer warriors, I've seen the attacks on their lives, sicknesses, and just um, some people getting into accidents that were just so weird, you know, like just the enemy trying to take people out. So this is why we need to have all the armor of God to protect us. And it's a defensive armor. It's a defensive armor. And the sword of the spirit is our offensive weapon. The sword of the spirit is offensive. And this is how we win the battles, branches. This is how we win the battle, warriors. The breastplate is our protection. Just as um, the police policemen have to wear those bulletproof Vests, vests, right, to protect them from, from the bullets that are coming from all over the place, while well, so is the breastplate of righteousness. And in the ancient world, they didn't have um, bulletproof vests, obviously, they didn't, but they, they did have the breastplate that they did wear to protect them from the arrows and the rocks and the spears and the swords from their enemy. That's why Paul uses that example, that breastplate, you know, and they needed that to protect their heart, to protect, you know, their, their, their hearts. <laughs> That's what, yeah, essentially. For... The, the breastplate does the same thing for us today. Because the heart is the center of life. Right. And I say, and spiritually. never leave home without your breastplate on. Never leave home without it. Keep it on. Because it protects us from Satan and in the war against sin. And we are in a battle against Satan on the war against sin. It's interesting because I've just had a thought that it's called it's the breastplate very of real. righteousness. Remember, you cannot put on a breastplate of your own righteousness. That's it right. won't stop anything. That's when right. it talks about the breastplate of righteousness here, it's talking about a form And we'll, of we'll get into that, yes. Are we going to be getting into that? Am of I course. getting ahead of you? No. I just want to say this is the righteousness, referring mm -hmm. to the righteousness of Christ. Amen. The, the breastplate is a very important part of our spiritual armor. It protects and covers our heart. All our emotions, all our affections, right? And I know a lot of you know you're in a fight right now for your life. Some of us are in the fight of our life, you know. And our, it, 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 it protects our emotions and our affections. You see, the Lord told us to guard our affections, right? To guard our hearts with all diligence. There's a reason for that. Both need to be guarded. If we're to keep away the temptations of the evil one. There are two ideas or concepts of righteousness in the New Testament. And both relate to our breastplate. This is right standing and imputing righteousness. I take it ahead of you. One is our position of right standing before a holy God. It's all about the goodness of God. The character of God. Right? Right? And the Lord's been telling us that lately, that we need to know the character of God. We need to know who our God is and um, who he is in our lives today. And I like to always say, I don't want to know who as much as I am in Christ. And, and that's important. But I want to know who the Christ is in me. Right? Who is Christ? Who is God? What is his characteristics, you know? And, and um, that becomes ours in Christ Jesus when we believe. It's, it's a gift of his grace, right? It's a gift of his grace. It's, it's part of justification. Right. Some of you might wonder what um, justification is. Being justified in the eyes of the Lord that says when, he, when you believe in faith that Christ has died for you, God will see you. He will. He will now see you. you. You have been justified. That there is no sin upon you. That that your sins have been has been dealt with. You are justified in the eyes of the Lord. You are made righteous in His eyes. But there's another step to that. There's this imputed righteousness that Anne's talking right, about. Right. Until Which I'm you getting take, into. Until you take that on. Mm -hmm. 
you're going to get into that. Okay. Well, until you, until you take it out, what I was thinking about, and it, we, I mean, there's a beautiful picture of this. We just, we talked about it a few weeks ago in the parables, the, the parable of the wedding feast. Mm -hmm. Remember the guest who came in, but he wasn't wearing the proper the robe. He wasn't wearing the, the marriage, the marriage robe, the wedding feast. Cause he didn't have the proper righteousness on before the King. And that's what this is talking. About. So there's the, the right standing. And then there's the imputing righteousness, which simply means to be uh, credited to our account. Yeah. When we put our faith in Jesus as our Lord and Savior, James 2.23 says this, Abraham believed God and it was imputed or counted to him to for him. righteousness. And he right. was called the friend of God. God. The friend of That's God. That's why we are friends of God. Amen. We have that imputed righteousness in us because we believe that we have it. And we receive this when we put all our sins in one pile and all our good works in another pile and run from both of them <laughs> to Jesus. <laughs> Amen. Amen. We run to Jesus. We leave all that behind. It's trusting totally in God's grace. Grace alone. He doesn't just forgive us of, of, of our sins, but he Absolutely. clothes us in the righteousness. The righteousness, Christ's righteousness, because all our righteousness is as filthy rags. Right? It's Where is that? In Deuteronomy? No. It's in, in Isaiah, I in, think. Oh, in Isaiah. I thought it was in one of those older books. Um, I'll find out for sure. Um, God then sees us in his Son. In his son as a sinless person because Jesus took on our sins. He took them on and gave us his righteousness. Isaiah 64. And six. that, my dear friendship. Hmm, Isaiah 64, is 6, if you're wondering. The Bible that, calls imputed righteousness. Where the filthy rags references. Right. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, there. yes, you did. Well, I must mean I still have filthy rags. No, no, Forgive no, me, no, 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 <laughs> no, no, I desire above all things the righteousness of Christ upon my Praise soul. God. Praise your name, Lord Jesus. Magnify your name. I thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. I glorify your name. So now what does God expect of us? He expects right behavior. Imparted righteousness. Romans 6, 7, and 8. And it describes a second kind of righteousness. It doesn't only impute his righteousness to us, but we also, it's imparted. Or place, okay. Go For on. he who has died has been freed from sin. Now if we died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over him. Right. And we discovered that yesterday. So he places his righteous nature in us. His Holy Spirit enables us by his power to live righteously. Because we left on our own, we've proven we are sinful, wretched. Without the Holy Spirit power, we couldn't do it. There's no way we're a match for Satan's kingdom. No way. Even Jesus. Jesus had to use the scriptures and Jesus, you know, had to to rely on God, the Holy Spirit. Remember, Hallelujah. remember, so, I know some of you can just, no, I'm just I, some of you remember this, that when Jesus was being tempted by the devil in the wilderness, he never once said to, to Satan, you, don't, his own you don't have the authority. You don't have the authority to do any of this, to tempt me for, with any of this. You don't have the power. He never said that. The inference there is he did have the power or he does have the influence, the authority for now. Um, until Christ came and destroyed his works. But Jesus, as Anne said, answered him by the word of God and by his testimony. Mm -hmm. Although the testimony comes of the rest of the gospel. I was going to say something and now... Oh, I'm sorry. I'm just going to speak quiet so, and drink my coffee now. We're to live a righteous life. 
by the Spirit's power in us. And we know this. This is like... Yes. We know this. We can only live a righteous he, life by the Spirit's power. And he helps us to have righteous motives, to think righteous thoughts, uh, to speak righteous words. Very important. Our words are very important. And to do righteous things, to act righteously. Righteous, to do righteous deeds. You know, those good works, you know, that Paul talks about, show me your faith and I'll show you my works, yeah. right? Um, so when others Jesus. see us, this, this second righteousness is holiness in our character and how we live, how we speak, how we act. We're expressing Jesus's life through our life. And it's like Jules was saying yesterday, little Jesus's, you know, Keith Green said that, um, we're kind of being, uh, we're, we're being Christ-like. We're made in his likeness, you know, and his image. We're, we're um, being changed into his likeness and his image. Yeah. Anyways, it, it's, it's a very practical kind of righteousness that others can actually see in our lifestyle. And as well as God, God sees it always anyways, right? So, so what does it mean? What does that mean? Well, having pure motives, having right attitudes, being obedient to, to God's authority, being obedient to authority, speaking the truth in love, you know, being honest in all of our affairs, working, being honest in our job, on our jobs, you know, as, as if Jesus were right there and he is <laughs> as if, Jesus, we're our boss. Jesus. Serving others joyfully. You know? And, and, and you know what? Holy Spirit is the key. Holy Spirit is the key. Romans 8. It talks about the Holy Spirit power. It is the key to living a righteous life. And only the Holy Spirit can do it. Not us. Not by might nor by power, right? We, we said this earlier. It's by his spirit, not by any works, not by, not by the flesh. And what is the standard for a righteous life? It's the law, right? It's the law. But the law can't help us live it right. Only the Holy Spirit can. Well, that's right. Only the Holy Spirit. Paul makes that argument about Mosaic yes. law. It was there to show us a mirror. This is what That's it takes right. to be That's sinful, right. but it's not possible for us to be That's that. That's right. But we wouldn't know that if we didn't have a, I've said this before, if we didn't have the standard of righteousness right. to measure right. it by. And that's why we have the Old Testament. And that's why we have the New Testament. That that's why line. we have the Word of God to be able to read it so that the Holy Spirit can measure truth. The Word of God is our plan. By the line. Word of God. Amen. And there's a key word in, in Holy Spirit's name. What is it? The? Holy. Spirit. Holy. Holy is it. Holy Spirit. So we can't grieve the Holy Spirit. Because we will. Because we'll all... lose his protection if yes. we grieve the Holy Spirit. Yes. And how do we do this? Well, whenever we give way to unholy desires, to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, um, you know, the pride, we give, we give way to pride. He is grieved. And the Holy Spirit really spoke this to me while, while studying this. He is easily grieved. Easily grieved. And we quench his power in our lives. His power is weakened. As it says in Ephesians 4.30. We're just going to read these two scriptures, Ephesians 4.30 and 1 Thessalonians 5.19. This is so important that we don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Oh. Okay, well, I'm probably going to have to. Let me read Ephesians 4.30. You're all familiar with this. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Right. Which tells me that the Holy Spirit can be grieved and is easily grieved. It's in 519, right? 
and I usually know when when I've grieved the Holy Spirit I get that feeling in my gut you know like something's not right you know just uh, he's grieved the Holy Spirit's grieved the very simple verse do not quench the spirit that's all it is first Thessalonians right. 19 but goes 519. with 519 519 that goes with Ephesians 430 mm -hmm. because he will lift his protection and we need his divine protection especially in these days especially today branches we need his divine protection when we do this it's like laying aside or um or or, or taking off our breastplate of righteousness and we leave ourselves wide open for the attacks of our enemy Satan and he doesn't waste any time either he does not waste oh, no, any he time not. either when, he sees an opening, when he we're wearing our on. breastplate there's protection for us but only as we are living right if we're committed to God you know and, and we're careful uh, living holy lives in everything that we say and do and think and you know and then we can enjoy his protection and we can enjoy his victory in our lives we need to be pure clean and right before the Lord and before others in our attitudes in our actions and in in our motives and what are our motives what motivates us well my motives always uh, need to be glorifying him and doing his will. Bottom line. And I miss it. Just ask my husband. <laughs> ask my wife. I miss it more. I, I miss it sometimes. You know, I strive to do what's right, but the Spirit of God, you know, like he comes in and convicts me. <laughs> I try to do what's right by the Spirit of God. And when I mess up, I go quickly and that's the key go quickly to to God in repentance and he has been crying out and calling us to repentance lately for the church to walk in repentance that he's been crying out that's the word of the hour repent 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 come to me come to me cast all your cares report to me cast all your cares upon me don't carry these weights around trust in me trust and obey do the will of the father do not fear man these are what the lord's been speaking lately keep the armor on the apostle john wrote to the church of sardis in revelations 3 4 to 6 these words and this is 60 years after jesus rose you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who overcomes shall be clothed in white garments, and I will not blot out his name from the Hallelujah. book of life. But I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. We're in a war. We're in a war. The second we accepted Jesus in our lives, we were on the battlefield. The split second we said, Jesus, come in. Come and make me new. I receive you. I believe in you. I give my life to you. That's when we became warriors, we ambassadors of Christ. That's, yeah. that's when we're in the battlefield. And there's no changing that. You can't change that. Unless you backslide from the Lord and you denounce him. Just remember that Satan will not allow you to leave his kingdom willingly or peacefully. He will do everything he can to pull you back. Mm -hmm. And all the steps lead from that point on downward. And there are none leading back out. If you renounce him, what, what does that say in, um, is it in Romans? Where you renounce him? 
Oh, publicly. Hebrews. Hebrews six. Yeah. Or Hebrews, yes. Anyways, um. Are you thinking about, um? If you put them to an open shame again. For it is impossible for those who are once enlightened and have tested, tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. Right. So if you renounce him, publicly renounce him, and you go the opposite direction and you're... Those steps just continue to lead downward, and there is none leading outward. So let's be very cognizant of that. Let's be awake and aware, very careful. We're in a battle for our souls. Satan is, is, is coming, especially now, on every side, and he's, he's ramping it up. And how did Paul and his, uh, and, uh, okay, let's start that again. How did Paul instruct us on war? <laughs> how did he instruct us? Ephesians 6, 18. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with uh, all prayer and supplication in the spirit. In the spirit, praying always. Be watchful to this end with all, all perseverance saints. and supplication for all the saints. Amen. So, make no mistake about it. Spiritual warfare is fought in the context of prayer. As Paul says. Amen. And all our prayer warriors said. Amen. Amen. we got to learn to fight on our knees, church. So many have fallen in this battle you know so many have fallen in this battlefield and and the battlefield is just littered with casualties especially today there were once um, powerful prayer warriors and I know lots of them prayer warriors for God uh, they were God was using them in a mi mighty way but they didn't keep on the breastplate of righteousness they allowed those little fiery darts to come in their mind, to come in their heart. I think Ephesians 6 is Paul's greatest writing on spiritual warfare. Let's read verse 10 to 14. Hmm. At least four times the word stand is mentioned here. Four times. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, Amen. but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this Amen. age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day yes. and having done all to stand. Stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Amen. Who is he writing this to? The church of Ephesus, right? This city was very wicked and evil. They they were involved in uh, I, I, idol worship, idolatry. It was a major shrine yeah. center and, and, because and it, it was they the were, center of the worship of Diana. They were steeped in sexual sins. You know, they had their temple prostitutes. It was a very unclean place. And all the religious temples were filled with prostitutes and every other immoral thing. And I can imagine there was a lot of temptation around for the Christians you know of that day just as it is in our day even a hundred times worse today actually I think yeah because we have the internet as, as we, we, we have the internet we have cable TV Everything is so uh, we have our phones you know we have the billboards we have advertisements and you don't even have to leave you know? your home to get it to find no it. you don't you know you don't and so to to survive in such an environment we have to keep on the breastplate of righteousness as it says in verse 14 what were you going to read nothing i'm going to read anything okay I'm getting what ready. were you going to read i'm going to read I'm, the, I'm in the that next thing i'm going to read power mode i'm in that like 
The Holy Spirit's just zeroing me in here. Hallelujah. And this means we must be disciplined in areas of our sexual desires and our appetites for worldly things. You know, we have to have that self-discipline, very self-discipline, especially for our prayer lives, because you know, when you start to get into prayer, that little parade, it comes right through your, tried to go through your mind, right? And then you have these lists of things, oh, I forgot to do this, or and it's like, this distractions are going on all around you. That is demonic. That is the enemy. Hallelujah. And we need to have self-discipline. Keep that helmet of salvation on, which we'll be getting into uh, in tomorrow's lesson. The helmet of salvation. The, the armor is so connected to prayer. So connected to intercessory prayer. Our breastplate is a gift from God. It's a gift of grace. When we are wearing it, we can march right into the enemy's territory. We don't have to be afraid. It, the battle can be won because we have the right. We have that right. And we can fight for God's glory. Captives can be set free. The chains, as Isaiah says, this is the fast that I have called, right? That you... Um, that you set the captives free, that you open the prison's doors. Um, you know, you break off the chains of bondage, that you feed the hungry, that you, you know, this list of things. Captives can be set free through prayer. This is exactly what happened in Ephesus, and it's happening totally today. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? Amen. Can I get praise the Lord? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's Amen. exactly what's happening That's today. That's what I'm talking about. A strong church grew in Ephesus through Paul's diligence. And, and some of Paul's greatest revelations were written to these believers. Do you know who the first bishop of Ephesus was? Hallelujah. Do you know who the first bishop of Go Ephesus? on, honey. Well, I'm asking you. Do you know who the first bishop Paul. of Ephesus? No. Okay, who? John. John, okay. The beloved disciple. It was a trick question, right? He was testing That's where me. Mary went after the fall of Jerusalem or the, the persecutions. He went because... I meant to say that. And why is that? Because Jesus said from the cross, John, behold your mother. Right. And she went to live with him in Ephesus when he became bishop. Oh, wow. Okay. I see. I would have said Paul. He was tricking me, folks. Paul founded the church. That's what I was... That's what I thought you meant. No. I say who's first bishop. Remember, he made oh, okay. Titus the first bishop. All right. He founded the church in Crete, but he made Titus the first bishop. Oh, all right. Okay. And Timothy the first totally bishop of Corinth, I think. Hmm. Okay. Anyways, we're, we're a little off course Corinth there, summer. but... Yeah, we're a little off course. Um, Back online. They were taught to see themselves as royal sons and daughters. Hallelujah. They didn't only die with Christ. But they were also raised with him, and so are we. To his royal, royal, his royal. his so royal. Anyways, his royal throne. I was saying, looking at throne and saying royal, and I said royal. royal. Okay, his royal throne in heaven. Hallelujah. They experience the grace of God promised to them. First Samuel two eight. We'll go there. Yeah, really? They experience the grace of God promised to them in He raises the eight. poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap. Yes. Yes. To set them among princes and make them inherit the throne of glory. Yes. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's, and he has set the world upon them. Amen. Okay. So I want to encourage us today, these promises can be experienced even in our lives. In our time. Even in our times of failure, in our times of discouragement. Somebody needed to hear this today. I'm sure a lot of people need Somebody needs to hear this today. David went through this, didn't he? David went through this big time. 
And there was a time in his life, actually a few times, when he failed so, fell on his face, like flattened him. And God gave him grace and restored him. Hallelujah. He was very repentant, very sorrowful. So when we fall, and we fail, and we will, because God is perfecting us, we're being sanctified daily, right? We will fail. But be quick to repent. Be quick, as David was, to come back into right fellowship with him. And we, we will be restored in God's grace. And how did the enemy get David's life? This is a part, important question that we study. How did these men fall? How were they restored? The enemy comes in whenever someone dishonors God's laws and defiles himself with sin. That's how the enemy comes in, through compromise of righteousness. When it comes to prayer, the breastplate of righteousness is crucial. David said in Psalm 66, 18. What did David say, honey? You were too busy chewing your nails. I'm too busy being on Psalm 40. <laughs> Hallelujah. We're going a little bit over today, but that's all right. That's okay. If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Right. So righteousness is essential. Very famous. To having a fruitful prayer life. James 5.16 says, The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man of as much. So God will not hear our prayers if there's sin iniquity in our hearts Amen. and what causes more problems in the church is the absence of righteousness especially in the leadership and you know what that all filters down through the head if you have an unrighteous an unholy leadership a pastor it's going to filter all the way down through the church yep seen it We've, we've seen it. Oh, yes. I'm sure you all have. We've seen it. So in our next lesson, we will be looking at the scepter of righteousness. So that's all we have for today. So, Lord, I thank you. I yes, thank Lord you, God. God. Lord, just bless, bless your people, Lord. Yes, Lord God. Today. Bless all the branches who are listening. Jesus, my name. Right May we take these words to heart and self-examine, Lord, as, as I've been self-examining, Lord. Strengthen your body right now, Lord. May we take serious, serious your words, Lord. Press in in prayer. Yes, Lord. Jesus, mighty name. Yes, Lord. Give you all the glory, the praise, and the honor. Yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. So, branches, have a blessed day. We're not going to close on a song today. Okay. So um, we love you and we're, we're always praying. And, and I just want to say one thing. If what we're sensing in our spirit, us intercessors, the ones that are pressing in in the night hours and calling on the Lord, and if what we're sensing is true and we believe it is, if things go down, and we don't see each other again through this means, then remember, we love you. We're praying for you always, every hour on the hour. <laughs> and I would ask that you continue to pray in this way as well. So I'm just putting that out there. It's kind of like um, a, a warning that things are about to change. And they're about to change it very quickly. So, and that's not so we live fearful because our trust and our hope is in the Lord and he's calling um, us yes, to trust right. trust and hope in him. But that's, we know where we're at in, in the times right now. We're very in serious times. And um, so if, that's just my request. 
and to believe above all things, because this verse seems to be coming up in the, in this in this particular season. It's coming. Remember, as you're praying about these things, keep this verse uppermost in your mind that He who is in you is greater than, than he, he who is, who in, is the in the world. Amen. So have a blessed day. Amen. And we love you. Bye bye. Till tomorrow. In the scepter of righteousness. Okay. Mm.